بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وعلى كل من تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما سبحانك اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم أرنا الحق حقا ورزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا ورزقنا اجتنابه وبعد Special brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I would like to first of all thank the organizers for this weekend workshop, two-day workshop. I say it's a two-day workshop, so please come back tomorrow and don't run away, even if it's boring. Uh, the Pearls of Paradise team and the Masjid here, Jama'a Masjid Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr Siddiq, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, for arranging this program, inviting me and all of you May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us tawfiq and ability to discuss things which are beneficial for us and we can implement it in our lives. This is a very important topic. Everybody, everyone's received a copy. Yes. The word marriage is written, highlighted in like big writings. Just to pull you guys. I actually didn't have the title marriage. There's no, no one from the organization here? Okay, I can say this. I never had the title marriage in uh, yeah. <clears throat> the word marriage in the title of this course. I actually named it protecting the relationship or protecting the marital relationship, dealing with marital conflicts and separation slash divorce. But then the organizers thought that we need to, in Canada, everyone just loves marriage. So we have to put marriage in big writings. I mean, people don't look at like the small, you know, marriage is highlighted quite a lot. And then it says protecting the relationship. So still people might read that. But people don't want read dealing with marital conflicts and separation slash divorce. And that's what the course is really about. Divorce and separation is something that we should talk about. Everyone needs to talk about it. It's people get scared. It happens so frequently, but everyone's scared about it. It's a taboo word. It's like a, you know, there's some words that people don't like to ever speak about. Like jihad, for example. You can't like, they say the J word. I actually I had a talk once here in Toronto, many, many years ago. <clears throat> I attended this RIS conference a couple of times, seven, eight years back. So the title they gave me was the J word. That's the title they put, the J word, and then there was some description underneath it, I can't remember now. Uh, so, <clears throat> this is what we're going to talk about. We will, of course, marriage, you can't, you can't talk about separation, divorce, unless you talk about marriage, and you can't talk about marriage unless you talk about separation, divorce, and problems, and conflicts, and it all comes together. So, we will talk about this topic. It's not like a marriage, marriage course from the beginning of marriage. And I remember that actually this is my third time I'm delivering a workshop here at this uh, event approximately one, two, three years ago. I remember in this same hall we had a weekend workshop on marriage. Did anybody attend that? It's just out of interest. I want to burn any of two brothers, mashallah. Any other sisters? Yes, there's some sister hands, mashallah. So this is a continuation, and that was two years ago. And then last year, I remember I delivered, I don't think it was this hall, but I delivered a workshop on tarbiyah, upbringing of children. You attended that. So this is like a continuation of the first course. <clears throat> Protecting the relationship, dealing with marital conflicts and separation and divorce. So we will, inshallah, tr try to cover all the points which are mentioned here. Uh, and I will try to explain them and look at them in a lot of detail. There's an introductory point here. 
A marital relationship requires constant nurturing, fostering, and striving. Along with the many benefits and positives that marriage brings into one's life, there are struggles and hard work. This is the reason why much reward has been promised in relation to marriage. Just like everything else in our life, we have to remember that marriage also has <coughs> or entails struggles and problems and difficulties and hardship. This dunya that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created is a world in which we have yusr ma'al usr. We all know Surah Alam Nashrah, right? Inna ma'al usri yusra. Hardship, difficulty with bliss. There's three worlds. Jannah paradise is where there's just only bliss and happiness. This is why the Quran says, La khawfun alayhim wa la hum yahzanun. About, if you look in the Quran, Allah talks about Jannah many times, describing, there's a lot of bounties described in Jannah, but this is the ultimate bounty. Some people don't think, because we, we are, we're very external, we look at things externally, so we look in the Quran, we'll see, Allah says, you'll get this in Jannah, you'll get bananas in Jannah, you know, all, all these things, and you will get Jannah in Tajri min tahtiha al-anhar, and there'll be <coughs> streams. The ultimate Jannah, you know, of course, the sight and the vision of Allah is the greatest ni'mah, but in terms of the ni'am that's given to us, this is why many ayat, verses, Allah says, لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون contemplate on that. That in paradise, there will be no fear and no sadness. In the world, it is impossible in this dunya for anybody to ever reach a stage in their life that they don't have fear at all. Fear is all about the future. Like um, aspirations, fear in terms of like what will happen, what will happen to my work, what will happen next week, what will happen today, what will happen to my family. We always, we live in a life of fear. Everything and everything around us is based on fear. All these policies and insurances, it all goes, it's all about fear. I might just go, my house might just get burned down and my car might just get, you know, crushed or I might just fall down and I might just slip there and I might just break my leg there and my head down there. This is the whole corporate system is based on fear, which goes against our good. So in dunya, the future is all about fear. Fear, oh, there's another word I'm looking for, uh, which is like not fear, fear, but fear of anticipating something going wrong. Any word? Anyone's mind? Apprehension. Apprehension, yes. It was with A, and that's the word I was looking for. We have apprehension. And yahzanun is for the past. Sadness. People are always slightly sad about something that's gone wrong. So in the dunya, it is impossible for anyone to ever reach a stage. It's just not possible. This is the only, this ni'mah is only in akhirah, in jannah. La khawfun alayhim wa la hum yahzanun. There is no apprehension, fear whatsoever, and no sadness, sorrow, depression, anxiety, stress. Because Yahzanun includes all of this stress. In Toronto, it looks like everyone's got stress. Like so many brothers here come and smile a bit. Like, it looks like you guys are all stressed. Huh? Everyone's in a stressed situation. Yesterday, last night, I had a talk somewhere. And everyone's, I said, just relax. Just you know, ease up a bit. People, people have so much stress in their life. Again, the system around us has made stress upon us. The system, work, job-related stress, work-related stress. Because the system around us, study-related stress. We all think we have to get this, and we have to earn this much, and we have to get this degree. We come here in this life for about 60, 70 years, and we think we have stress of 500 years. The life is 65, 70 years, and the stress is as though we're going to live here for 500 years. If we really realize that it's only 65, 70 years, sometimes homeless people are more happy than us. Seriously, I've spoken to some homeless people. I actually go and sometimes if I see them, just sit down and talk to them and see like what's going on. It's like, okay, I've had some food and then I've got some, I'm just going to sleep. There's people who, who have millions and they need medicine to sleep. They can't sleep. 
and there's homeless people who have nothing and they sleep better. They snore away and nobody can even, you know, they're sleeping outside of the mansion, they have a better sleep. There's no stress. The real contentment, so this is all yahzanun. In Jannah, there is la yahzanun, no stress. Anyway, I was going off topic there slightly, but to point this out, that this dunya is a mixture of bliss, happiness, some days you're in a good mood, some days you're in a bad mood. Some days you feel good, some days you don't feel that great. And Allah protect and Allah protect us, I mean, hellfire is completely opposite. It's just always sadness and sorrow. These are the three alam, three worlds that Allah has created. Jannah, Jahannam, hellfire, paradise, and dunya is in the middle. So in the dunya, everything, everything, is a combination of yusr and usr. Everything. Which includes family, which includes marriage. <coughs> no one in the history of mankind ever said that you will, have mar- you will get married and you will never ever have any problem whatsoever. It's just <coughs> illogical, it's impossible, and it's just ridiculous to think. <coughs> it's part and parcel of life and part and parcel of marriage that marriage is a bumpy ride. Ups and downs, ups and downs. Yes, different people will experience different levels. Some people will experience more troubles, some people will experience less troubles, like every aspect of life. But at the end of the day, Allah balances everything out. So some people have more troubles and stress and hardships in their work-related life, but their marriage is fine. Like, they'll have less problems. It's not like no problems, but less problems. Some people might have problems with their health, but then in another department, they're okay. So if you look at all the depart- departments and areas of life, that's when it balances itself out. So we have to, this is the first point that we have to remember, that it is impossible to think that marriage will not have problems. People before marriage don't realize this. There might be some people here who are not married. Anybody? Just put your hand up for the very There's a few brothers here. So, you know, once, I think I mentioned this before here as well, I don't know if I did, but once I was teaching a course in marriage, <clears throat> and whilst teaching the course, you know, in the beginning, like a few years ago when we had that course here, in the beginning we look at all the hadiths on the fadail and the benefits and the virtues of marriage. You know, there's so many hadith, Ya ma'ashar al-shabab, man istata'a minkum al ba'a, etc, etc. All the hadith about the fadail of nikah, the books of hadith are filled with them. So when I was mentioning them, a brother asked a question, he said, can I ask a question? He said, yes, go ahead. He said, I have a, these thoughts come to my mind. When I look at Islam, generally, all the aspects of Islam on which there is a lot of, uh, uh, regarding which a, a, a lot of reward is promised, there's a lot of fadai. They all seem to be difficult things, like five times prayer, so much reward. It's difficult, of course. Waking up for Fajr Salah is difficult. The Hajjud Qiyamul Layl is difficult. Fasting, long days, summer is difficult. But there's a lot of reward. And I said to him, I confirm. I said, yes, that is. That's actually mentioned in the Hadith because the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, "Fujibat al Jannatu bil Makari." Paradise is veiled by apparently difficult things. If we want to enter paradise, we have to do things which are difficult. Wake up for Fajr, pray five times, give zakat, perform Hajj, uh, fast in Ramadan, stay away from sins. It's not easy, it's difficult. So Jannah is veiled with apparently difficult things. And hellfire is veiled with apparently desirable things. Sins are apparently apparently desirable. So not praying salah, not offering salah, not waking up a fajr, it's easier. Not fasting, it's easy. Sins, theft, robbery, zina, fornication, adultery, whatever, whatever, all these things. They're apparently pleasurable. So that those apparently, the veil is pleasurable. When you go into the veil, there's hellfire behind it. That's what the hadith says. And that's what the brother was saying. And you know what? This is actually the sunnah of Allah even in this world. It's not Jannah and Jahannam only. If you look in the world, I'll give you one example. One example. Anything in the world, yeah? If somebody wants to, for example, lose weight or tone up or somebody wants to go to the gym or, or somebody wants to live a healthy lifestyle somebody wants to start eating healthy which is also something which is part of Islam 
Yes? It's too many donuts. You guys get too spoiled with these Tim Hortons here. I don't know if it's healthy or not, Tim Hortons. <laughs> donuts and croissants and it's just so much. So, anyway, healthy lifestyle is part of the teachings of Islam. We should try to eat healthy food and live. Look, there's some fruits down there. Try to eat fruits. Honestly, it, you know, breakfast should be, should have just a lot of fruit. When you have breakfast, first thing, just fill yourself with fruit. Then if there's a bit of remainder, then you can have fruit. And um, when you start eating, first fill your plate with salad. That's what I do. When I see salad somewhere, I just fill the whole plate. First, one plate full of salad. So you're half full with salad. Then there's no space for all the other, sometimes, junk food. But this is also from the teachings of Islam. We can talk about this. So anyway, if, you, if somebody goes to a nutritionist or a dietitian, they say, okay, uh, can you suggest to me food? I want to eat healthy. Give me a list of things I should eat and the list of things I should avoid. What will the person say? The things to eat? Okay, you want to be healthy? You want to have a good diet? This is a list. Kebabs, burgers, pizza, chips, cakes, sugar, as much as possible, you'll be so healthy. Sweets, chocolates, 20 chocolates a day, croissants, burgers, you know. That's not going to be the case. These are apparently pleasurable things. Why wasn't it that Allah just, I was thinking, why didn't Allah just make it like that? That to be healthy, eat so much pizzas and cakes and sweets. And if you eat all, you know, salad and all of that, then you become like fat and obese. It could have been possible. But even in the dunya, the sunnah of Allah is that something you want, an aim and goal you have to reach, you have to struggle a bit. The things you don't want to eat, you have to eat them. And the things you want to eat, you have to avoid them. The same thing, Jannah and Jahan. Sins seem, sin, sins are like, you know, these, these uh, pleasure, apparently pleasurable things, cakes and burgers and sweets and snacks and chocolates. So this is the sunnah of Allah, even in the dunya. So anyway, I was saying this brother asked this question, that when I look at Islam, because I was remember, I mentioned that I was mentioning all the different hadiths about the fada'il of nikah, marriage. Uh, so he said, if I look, when I look at Islam, all the different laws and rules of Islam and all the different aspects on which there's a lot of reward, it, it seems that they are all apparently difficult things. But it looks like there's only one exception. And the exception is marriage. There's so many hadiths you're quoting, one after the other, one after the other, that you get so much thawab and so much reward. But that's one exception, that it's a pleasurable thing and yet you get so much reward. I said to him, brother, are you married? He said, no. And I said, that's why you're saying that. Ask the people who are married, they'll tell you it's easy to wake up for Fajr Salah and then remain married. That's why there's more reward. Ask the people who are married, it's easy to wake up every night and offer eight raka'at qiyamun layf tahajjud and then remain in a stable marriage. Because it is a struggle. We have to talk about this, especially more so in our era because of all the different challenges that we are faced with. So nobody ever said in history of humanity that marriage would be easy. Everyone, you know, to, honestly, every human being has, like I said, this dunya is a combination of ups and downs. So every person's, every person's marriage has issues. Everyone, and I mean everyone. The teacher and the teach, people who are teaching and, and being taught. Forget the teacher and the people being taught. The Anbiya, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once contemplated divorcing all his wives. Ya Nisa al Nabi. What's the verse? Ta'alayna umatti' kunna wa usarrih kunna sarahan jameela wa in kuntunna turidna Allah wa rasulahu wa dara al akhira. Ba inna Allah a'adda li muhsinati min kunna ajra al azima. Ibrahim, peace be upon him. When he came, ghayyir atabat tababik. He advised his son Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam, divorce your wife, and then he remarried. If a prophet can divorce his wife, some people think divorce is like, oh, the greatest haram you've committed on planet earth. No. Sahaba divorced their wives. There was divorce in Sahaba's marriages. 
if Sahaba divorced, Prophet, I mean Ismail I know about, I don't know if there's any other Prophet who did, Allahu Alam. Maybe worthwhile checking this out sometime. If there's any other prophets who divorced. So this shows that there's everybody. That's dunya. So there's no, you know, there's nobody who has a, there's no such a thing as perfect marriage. Even though people try to show you on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and whatever you have. There's no one. They all, that couple that was, you know, put their picture up. That they were eating in a nice, cozy restaurant like the two lovebirds. They saw that picture and they were just being, you know, having, being envious, looking at that picture. You just saw that picture and you didn't see that afterwards when they went home, what kind of big fight they had. They didn't put that picture of him punching her and, you know, she, she uh, you know, swearing at him or whatever. Nobody puts that picture up. So there's no such a thing as perfect marriage. That's, this is just an introductory point. Everyone, even the so-called, even practicing, you can be practicing as well. That's why sometimes, you know, some scholars, some imams may go through divorce, people say, oh, like I say to them, they just say, Ibrahim, Ismail, am I better than Ismail, salam? No. So if Ismail, peace be upon him, can divorce his wife, what's an imam? In comparison, in relation to Ismail, peace be upon him. It's possible. Doesn't mean if you're practicing being, that's it, you will never ever divorce. We're going to look at 10, I think there's 10 or 12 reasons um, that we're going to look at, inshallah. Um, 10. I thought it was 12. Yeah, yeah there's 10. Those are very important. I think I might have missed one got in my notes here, but let's see, inshallah. So, this is very important to remember. So, marital relationship requires constant nurturing. It's a job on its own. Those who are married, we need to take marriage seriously. Just like we take our jobs seriously. Just as we take our jobs seriously. We have to take marriage seriously. It's a job, but not that type of job. So it requires constant nurturing, fostering, striving, constantly. So along with the many benefits and positives, there are also struggles and hard work. And this is why so much reward has been promised in relation to marriage. And also one slight point before we go to the next section, the rates, rate of divorce. So I said, look, marriage problems, it's possible and it's common and there's no, no, no such a thing as perfect marriage. But from that, we should not take this that, okay, oh, that means, you know, just, I've just got problems and I just want to carry on problems because, you know, the teacher said that everyone has problems. So just like have problems today. Yeah, it's part and parcel. Yeah, I swear. I'm swearing at you. It's part of marriage. It's okay. That's not what I'm trying to say. So marriage problems are part and parcel of our lives. But that doesn't mean, just like every aspect of life, there are hardships. We try our best to decrease and lessen those hardships. So we have to work. We will never have a perfect marriage, but we could get to like 90%, 80%, 75%. 75%. So we have to work and we have to look at the reasons that cause disputes in marriage and try to better ourselves and try to better our marriages. And the rates of divorce in this day and age are seriously, they are increasing, increasing, even within the Muslims. Probably never been as high. And there's many, many reasons. And these are, this is why we're looking at all these reasons. You know, marriages in olden times lasted much longer. Even within the non-Muslims, the wider community, marriages in the olden times lasted much longer. If you look at even some non-Muslims, people who were married in 1920s or 30s or 40s, you'll see an 80-year-old couple. You might know some people in your neighborhood. Old man and old woman still madly in love. That's what we call true love. They remained married. They never had distractions of their phone and internet and the media and all of this. And there were other reasons as well. 
the traditional way of living really seriously helped people's lives, their personal relationships. So we've got more challenges, and our children will have even more challenges. Because the more there is advancement in technology, the more problems it brings into our lives. We've gone through two revolutions, or at least one revolution in our lifetime. In, in our lifetime. Some people have one revolution, and that's like a big thing. If you, if you go through one revolution in qilab, in, in, in your life, it's like a massive thing. Most people, a lot of people have gone through two revolutions. What's the first revolution? The internet. I don't know, there might be some people who were, who just were born after internet. Anyone? Some people pre-internet life? Do you remember? I, I remember, I'm old. Yeah. Brother, this brother here. Pre-internet life. 1990s, even though there was a bit of internet, but like it wasn't common. I remember. I made my first email in 2000. I used to study in Damascus, Syria. In 2002. So just to keep in contact, because my sister, she made an email or something, and then she told me on the phone that there's a new thing called email, so you could do... So we used to, there was a first new internet cafe opened in Damascus. So we had to go there for one hour, you had to pay a certain amount of money, and then every week I used to go there, and then I was trying to see what, what was this email and how do you make it, and just getting used to this idea of making an email, and then, this is good, you don't have to write a letter home now. So I stopped then the letters, because the first year I used to send letters back home from Syria when I was studying. In 2002 this was. So people went through revolution. And then the second revolution is this. Smartphones. It's completely changed our life, honestly. It's, I personally feel فيه إثم كبير ومنافع للناس وإثمه أكبر من نفعه you know, alcohol, Allah says, there's benefit in alcohol. There's harm in it and there's benefit. But the harm outweighs the benefit. Now this, people can have two opinions. There's benefit and harm. Everyone agrees that there's benefit and harm. I personally feel that the, the harm outweighs the benefit. For most people, for some people it might not be, but for a lot of people, just so much problems in our society, in our cultures, it's because of this smartphone, young children, anyway. So, we have, we live in a time where the rate of divorce has really increased to the point that one in about three marriages or maybe one in two marriages end in divorce. Even within Muslims, one in three Muslim marriages end up in divorce and separation. So we will look at those reasons, inshallah, uh, as we go along. <clears throat> so this, the way we're going to discuss this, that in the beginning there's, there's two important ingredients for a happy marriage, and then we've got a discussion on those ten reasons, factors of breakdown of marriage. Each one requires a lengthy explanation, and then we'll try to end that today. And then tomorrow we'll talk about the divorce and separation and some fiqh of divorce. So we'll, we'll do that tomorrow, inshallah. So first try to save your marriage, and then if have to go for a divorce then what's the procedure of divorce and all of that we'll look at inshallah two important ingredients for a happy marriage taqwa and tazkiyah these are two golden principles golden principles for a happy marriage these two words are really 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 so, when we say happy marriage, like I said, not a perfect marriage, but somewhat happy marriage. How I explained in the beginning. So, it's not a perfect marriage, but a somewhat happy marriage. Two important ingredients. We must bring these two things into our lives. These two words, I mean, each one of them requires like a couple of hours, one hour on each. You must have heard of the word taqwa, and you must have heard of the word dazkiya. So, I don't really need to go into the details, but I just want to connect it with marriage. Taqwa. Have you heard of the word taqwa? Yes, everyone has. Probably the most quoted verse, uh, most quoted, uh, quoted concept or term in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna Allah ma'al muttaqeen. Ya yuhal ladhina amanu taqullah. 
It's just such an important part of deen. The whole deen is based on taqwa. What is taqwa? What do we, what do we translate taqwa as? Taqwa is a word that is impossible to translate. So there must be one translation in someone's mind. Anything? Oh, God consciousness is a good translation. That's the one I like. But awareness, God consciousness. Some people say fear of Allah. But you know, Arabic language is so unique. In in English, we said apprehension, fear. Yeah. But still, like fear and apprehension is kind of the same thing. It's a fear. In Arabic, you have different words for different types of fear. There's one fear that you're you're, you're scared of a scorpion or a lion. Or spiders. <laughs> Some people are scared of spiders. No, it's okay, it's no problem. Um, so you're you're scared of an animal. That's a fear. Sometimes you you're scared of uh, gangs murdering you or looting you. Fear from human beings. There's different types of fear, and there's one type of fear which is out of ultimate love and respect and awe. So the fear sometimes people have from their parents, like from their father for example, is not like the, the father is a lion. Sometimes it is that type of fear as well, like the father's become a lion. You know, so that, that's, I'm not talking about that. It's like, you know, children fear, that's the thing that the children are not supposed to fear their parents like they fear animals. They are supposed to fear their parents in a loving, respectful way. One of my teachers says that, he's in his 80s, 70s now, that in my whole life, my father never, never got angry at me or hit me or anything like that. Maybe one, two occasions it was when I was small. But always gave me so much love and so much time and full of love. Yet, when we were young, when we used to pass by his room and he would be in his room reading or whatever he would be doing, we used to fear him, despite never getting angry. This fear was like, I don't want to walk or disturb him, or I don't want my father, I don't want him to see me like... So this is a different type of fear. The fear that you have with Allah is that type of fear. It's called taqwa and it's called khashya. So you have khawf. Khawf is a word which means fear that can be used can be used for Allah, but also khawf can be used for other types of fear. Taqwa and khashya is a very specific type of fear which is out of all venerance, uh, respect, and veneration, and awe. Yeah. So, taqwa basically means that a person in his or her life all the time has this type of awe of Allah, this type of awareness. Consciousness. If you want to describe taqwa, and then I will relate it to marriage, it's basically a person lives a life where before doing anything, before saying anything, so a physical action, a verbal statement, before writing anything online on Facebook, or whether people know your identity or not, and before making any gestures. Qawl fa'al, before saying anything, doing anything, writing anything, or making any gesture. Gesture could be part of fa'al, but like, you know, just uh, some gesture. Before any of this, the person thinks to themselves that Allah is watching over me and is aware and is conscious of Allah and realizes that they will have to give an account to Allah in the next life about what they've just said, what's come out from their mouth or whatever they've done or whatever they've written. This is the meaning of taqwa. Now imagine in a marriage, if someone goes into a marriage and all the time in their marriage, before they speak and open their mouth and talk to their spouse, before they swear at their wife or their husband, before they start getting angry, they think, well, Allah's going to question me about this. Then it will prevent them from doing that. This is taqwa, a marriage based on taqwa. And this is why, this is why, you know, look, 
three verses of taqwa mentioned. You know, a lot of times people, people should understand what is marriage. Especially in, in the non-Arab culture, we have a very robotic, robotic way of practicing Islam. A very robotic way. So when a nikah takes place, you have a marriage ceremony, you go into the masjid or whatever the place is, and the nikah ceremony is taking place, the imam is reading something, we think it's just some, like, whatever he's reading, it's some blessings going on. It's not blessings in Islam. You don't even, actually, you don't need, it's not a requirement to have an imam to conduct your marriage. It's, it's not Christianity. You don't need baptism, or you, need, you don't need to be baptized, or you don't need some blessings. The imam will say, now you're blessed in your marriage. This is not Christianity. You don't, you don't, the only reason why we go to an imam is because we don't know the rules of Islam. If you know it yourself, you've got basic knowledge of Islam, you just conduct your own marriage. What's the problem? Let's get the sister, sit here, and recite, and I'll sit here, get the witnesses, and recite the verses of the Quran, and then read it, and say, Alhamdulillah, I'm, I'm marrying you know, myself, and I'm reciting the khutbah myself. You don't really need it. The Sahaba, that's how they would get married. Do you know something? And recently we were having this discussion with some scholars, that you will find very rare examples in the Sunnah literature of nikah ceremonies in the time of the Sahaba. Pick Sahih al-Bukhari, Muslim, Tirmidhi, Abu Dawood, Ibn Majah, and Nasa'i, and all the other hadith books. Very rare, hardly any examples of, okay, today is the nikah wedding of this person, this Sahabi, and the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam is conducting a marriage ceremony. And they, they would not even inform the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam that they were getting married. Like, it's not a big deal. It's examples that he, he asked one companion, where were we, like, you know, uh, he saw a stain on his clothes, Abdurrahman ibn Auf. You probably know the story. And he said, oh, this, uh, this is perfume. Last week I got married. He said, oh, limu lo bishati. They never used to make big marriage wedding ceremonies. They would just get married, like home or whatever, like, okay, a few people. So there, there are very few examples of, like, proper marriage ceremonies taking place. So in the nikah ceremony, what the imam is reading is what we call khutbatul hajah. And that's not just for the nikah. That was the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam before any important matter. So when he used to give a sermon, the khutbah of Jumu'ah, that's why it's recommended, you don't have to, but many imams have this practice. I certainly do. But always, whatever the khutbah of Jumu'ah is about, regardless, the khutbah will start with the khutbah al hajah which is Alhamdulillah, Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inu bihi wa nastaghfiruhu wa nastahdi wa na'udhu billahi ta'ala min shuroori anfasina wa min siyaati a'malina You probably know this, man yahdi illahu fala mudilla lah wa man yudhulil fala hadiya lah and then you say the shahadatain and then you recite these three verses even before a business contract the same khutbah you know between two Muslims if you're buying a car from another Muslim do your business contract like this you'll get some barakah in there as well if you're buying a car from, from another Muslim, then both of you sit down and before you sign the contracts and whatever you, you do the deal, recite this khutbah al hajjah It's a sunnah for not just marriage, any important matter. You're enrolling into a, a university degree, for example. Recite this khutbah and then inshallah after that, enroll. So this was the khutbah in which these three verses were recited by the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Especially at the time of nikah, they are really, really important. All three verses, they have one thing in common, taqwa. Imagine at the time of marriage, there is no verse of the Quran quoted in which there is mention of nikah. There's no verse. Allah could have, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam could have recited فَانْكِحُ مَا طَابَ لَكُمْ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ مَثْلَ وَثُلَاثُ وَرُبَعُ وَأَنْكِحُ الْأَيَامَ مِنْكُمْ وَالصَّالِحِينَ مِنْ عِبَادِكُمْ or marriage, the zawwaju, that's a hadith. But Quranic verses about marriage, no. 
The verses that were recited are all to do with taqwa because taqwa is something that is important throughout our life but it, taqwa is more important at the time of marriage because the one who is getting married or the two who are getting married they are both being reminded and not just them two but their families the bride and the groom and their walis and their guardians and their families and everyone else is being reminded that look this is a new chapter of your life which is marriage and if you want prosperity and you want to maintain this marriage and you want to have blessings in this marriage then the only 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 way is taqwa this is why this these verses are recited but a lot of people don't know what's going on especially if you don't know arabic like you just think you know it's some kind of some blessing going on it's like you know whatever every imam who's lead, who's conducting a marriage ceremony should translate these verses explain before you, if, if there's someone who's an imam, if you ever conduct a marriage ceremony, first translate, mention this, that look, there's three verses of taqwa. Why are we reciting them? Because it's a sunnah of Allah's Messenger, sallallahu ta'ala wa sallam. Why? Because taqwa, marriage is based on taqwa. So from now on, till you pass away, throughout your life, especially everything related to marriage, this is what Islam says. If you want your marriage to be blessed and you want it to be maintained and blissful and have happiness in your marriage, then it's going to be based on taqwa. So the Imam should explain this. Translate the three verses and explain the concept of taqwa. These three verses, I've mentioned here, I won't recite them all, but you can recite them yourself where the translation is there. One is uh, the first verse is Surah An Nisa. Until the end of the verse, the translation is there. Uh, and then the second one, Ya Surah Ali Imran, verse 102. Last one is quite um, significant. Ya Another point that's come to my mind. You know, throughout the Quran, this Ya they all have Ya Yuhalladina. Amanu o ya yuhan nasu taqu. The first one has ya yuhan nasu taqu. O you, O men, O people, O you, O men, fear your Lord. And the second one is O you who believe and O you who believe. But you know, there's many other verses in which Allah has mentioned ya yuhan ladina amanu taqu Allah. Straight away after that, Allah mentions different different things. This is a point that's just come to my mind, which the Mufassirun mentioned that what Allah mentions straight. After and directly after Ya Yuhaladina Amanu Taqullah is the method of acquiring taqwa. So Ya Yuh Ya Yu what's that one? Ya Yuhaladina Amanu Taqullah Wal Tandur Nafsum Maqadamat Ligad. Here the verse three, Ya Yuhaladina Amanu Taqullah, O you who believe fear Allah or have consciousness of Allah, straight after that, wa kulu kawlan sadida. And speak in straightforward words. Qawlan sadida. It's talking about controlling the tongue. If you want taqwa, then one of the methods is protect your tongue. And seriously, that is such an important part of marriage. You know, when we say protecting the relationship, I think if you protect the tongue, you protect the relationship. If you protect the tongue, we protect the relationship. Because this tongue is a very dangerous part of our bodies. The hadith says that this is a tongue with, with one word it can take you to the depth of hellfire and with one word it can take you to paradise. This is a hadith in Surah al tirmidhi Sometimes people say certain things لا يلقي لها بالا You don't really think of it. But you go, you say words من سخط الله From the displeasure of Allah. يهوي به في نار جهنم And sometimes People make statements and they don't really think about it and you can take them to paradise. So, this is a reminder, taqwa, it's repeated, repeated, especially at the time of marriage. Now when we look at marriage, this is to emphasize and remind each party that a marriage cannot be successful without the fear of Allah and being conscious of the fact that he's watching you and that one will be answerable for everything one says or does. Now here I've divided this taqwa into three different stages. I want to move, move on quickly because we want to get onto those reasons that cause marriage problems. Um, a, B, and C. Taqwa before marriage, taqwa at the time of marriage, and taqwa after marriage. See, these are the ways, if we want blessed 
marriages and blissful marriages, then we have to we have to implement these things into our lives, brothers and sisters. Taqwa before marriage. Start off on the right foot by avoiding sins such as fornication, glancing at, at, law, at unlawful things, and dressing inappropriately. Before marriage, try and live at least a few months sin-free before marriage, and definitely, of course, during engagement. This is taqwa before marriage. Some people think that, you know what? They can carry on sinning. The day I get married, that's the day I'm going to become Angel Jibreel. And I'll be the most pious. That's it. All my sinful activities and related to the sexual desire, they will all just automatically, just overnight. And then the person realizes that he got married and he still has the same problems, the same like things such as being addicted to porn. We're going to talk about that later. We're going to be open and frank about some of the issues when you talk about things that create problems in the marriage. And the guy's thinking, I was, as soon as I get married, then I'm going to stop all these things. It's because I'm not married. How can I you know, save myself, protect myself? But then he realizes that he's got married and he's still got the same problems. Then he thinks, ah, oh, maybe I need a second wife. This is, people think they think the second wife is because they, you know, they they've got a lot of desire and they need, you know, they have a second wife. It's still the same. It's not that you need a second wife. It's that you haven't cleansed your heart, brother or sister, the main brothers in this case. Because there's no purification of the heart. That's the problem. It's, you could have four hundred and forty-four thousand wives. Just a random number. Yeah. Still, you will have these problems in your life. And there's people who've gone through this, oh, I need a second. Maybe, maybe I need three, I have so much desire. Maybe I need four. Still the same problems. So the issue is that before marriage, and I'm gonna be open, this, is, this can affect both women and men. And in this day and age, it affects women as well. In the olden times, it was unheard of within women. It was more like a male problem of having these extreme lustful desires. So people from a young age watch porn, masturbation, uh, glancing sexually, which is also a sin, like sexual glances at opposite gender, looking at nudity physically in person. <clears throat> um, and then of course, Zina itself and fornication and, and zina is zina of the eyes, zina of the hands, zina in the hadith says zina al ayni and nadar, zina of the eyes to see at which means looking at watching porn and nudity. That's what it means. Glancing sexually at things. So all these things in the olden times it was more or mainly just a male problem. But now it's become as much as a female problem. Why? Because of the great revolution that we've been through. Great. That's why I said, if this revolution, this great thing that we have in our hands, the easiest access to any porn that you want. In the olden times, people had to go and buy, you know, hidingly underground bunkers or something in India, Pakistan. Pakistan actually, there's actually a whole book. We'll talk about this later in more detail. There's a book written uh, on porn called Pornified. It's worthwhile reading. It's an American author, I think. She's called Pamela Paul. Actually, she actually attended one RIS conference many, many years ago. I don't know if it was Canada. It must be Canada because they used, we used to have one in California and I went there as well a few times. And there was a session on this topic. And there was a, the session was she spoke and Sheikh Hamza Yusuf spoke. He spoke from the Islamic side like seven, eight years ago. And she came, she, she came with the, you know, she's covered, she came with the scarf. She, she's not Muslim, but just uh, <clears throat> in respect for Muslims, she covered uh, herself. It's a very famous author, and that book is worthwhile reading. The statistics in that book, and according to her research that time, when she wrote it a long time ago, 
some of the countries where porn is downloaded the most, the highest was Pakistan Sharif. Muslim countries, and then some other Muslim countries. It's quite sad. So anyway, um, what was I saying? So all these uh, sins, such as fornication, etc., dressing inappropriately, flirting, even flirting, before marriage, taqwa, before marriage, requires that you, we don't do all of this. Because once these habits set in our nature before marriage, then they will continue even after marriage. Like, yeah, well, the thing I was saying that this is more even a problem for females now. That, that's what I was saying. That before it was only a male problem in the olden days. Now even females, see, they watch porn. But whether it's porn or whether it's even inappropriate dressing, flirting, if, if, if there's a woman, for example, and she has a habit of always flirting with men at the workplace, at the college, at the university, at the school, wherever, she's just always, she just has this flirty nature. And she's always flirty. And she likes all the attention of men. The more attention, the more buzz she gets. It becomes a spiritual disease. Doesn't mean she will even do zina. Sometimes that woman who likes all the attention will probably not do zina. But the problem is that she likes attention of men. And that's why she will dress and she will put perfume and she'll go like she'll wear skirts and she'll wear tight, you know, clothing and etc. And the more men looking at her, the more buzz. It's an addiction. It gets to the brain. It's a type of addiction. All these addictions. Porn is an addiction, masturbation is an addiction, wanting attention of the member of the opposite gender or member of the same gender. We have to talk about that so in this day and age. Wanting attention, inappropriate dressing, it can reach a level of addiction and it, um, what's that? Dopamine, you know, the part of the brain, it affects the same part of the brain. When it becomes an addiction, then nikah and marriage is not going to solve it. That's why we need to work before marriage. People go like that in marriage, then they're going to have problems in marriage. I'm just being honest. I, I have had cases of people, marriage problems. I've been dealing with marriage problems for years on end now. And I've said this many times that from the different topics and questions that we receive, marriage and divorce and marriage problems is the most common question or the issue or the problem that people reach out to you. Oh. Everywhere, England, everywhere. I've had cases, I remember, many cases, but it's just one, one example. Once a sister, uh, she contacted me and she said her husband doesn't have sexual relations with her, rather his complaints of what? I'm tired, I've got stress, I don't have energy. And then, after I go to sleep, I see him on my same bed, masturbating to porn on his, on his computer, laptop, or iPad, or whatever. It's crazy. In the beginning, I was thinking, what, this guy's got some mental health issues? Like, okay, you can think that sometime, still haram, but someone who doesn't have a spouse, so he needs to go and fulfill his desires in some haram way. But this guy, he has a spouse, and he's replacing that spouse with porn. I first I thought this is this is some crazy. I thought are you making it up? This was many years ago. Then I looked into this issue. Did some research on this issue. And I actually found out that this is quite common. And I found out that this porn does this to people. Because people are they're not naturally able to have intimacy with because Islamic intimacy is based on deep spiritual connection. That's why I wrote a book, which some of you may know of my book, Islamic Guide to Sexual Relations, but now it needs a, <coughs> it's been eight, nine years, it needs a new edition, and uh, I'm going to write a few more chapters to it, inshallah, in the beginning of next year, and we're going to publish a new edition to it. We're going to, because there's, there's no section on porn and things like that in there. So I want to add all these type of things in there. So this happens. 
that people are not able, to, and this is what porn does. Anyway, I wasn't going to talk about porn right now because there's actually a section on that. But the point was that before marriage, before marriage, if there's an addiction, then remove that addiction. That's the point. Taqwa before marriage means this A. Taqwa before marriage, remove that addiction. I'm talking about addictions relating to lust. I'm not talking about coffee. If you're drinking coffee, Tim Hortons before marriage, this is not even coffee, but, you know, but if you're drinking, you carry on drinking, it's okay, no problem. If your wife doesn't like it, you say, you know what, well, I drink coffee, so but you'll have to live with it. French vanilla is not a coffee, right? Okay, okay I always have this, this thing. We've actually, before, one of the reasons I used to come to Canada was just to have this. I was saying the brothers yesterday in Oshawa, this is my 16th trip. My son comes this. I didn't know about my son. Before he was, he was even born, I started coming. My first time I visited Toronto. This is just Toronto. I've been to other parts of Canada. It was in 2007. I came three times in that year. So, 16th trip, this one. So one of the reasons was Tim Hortons, but now we've actually got Tim Hortons in the UK. Just last year they've opened two places, one in Birmingham, one in Manchester. So, no need to come anymore here. For the redeem. So anyway, addiction before marriage, it's really important to remove these addictions. So addictions relating to the sexual desire. And I've also mentioned here, this is just a suggestion. Try and live at least a few months sin-free. Sin, I mean, we all commit sins, but you know, sins relating to the lust and desire. A few months sin-free, if it's possible, try to live sin-free before marriage. And also during engagement. So this is taqwa before marriage. Quickly moving on, taqwa at the time of marriage. Avoid simple practices, conduct the nikah in accordance with the sunnah and keep it simple. The simpler the walima and the marriage ceremony as a whole, the better it will be, inshallah. So taqwa at the time of marriage. Remember, brothers and sisters, Nikah is an ibadah, it's a worship. Islamically, nikah is what? It's ibadah. This is another point. I recently gave a talk somewhere in London and I talked about this topic. One hour just on this topic, what I'm just going to say now in two minutes. What happens is that most of our Muslim people, most people in the Muslim community, we look at marriage and nikah differently to other acts of ibadah. This is common, and it's, it's subconsciously, it's not our fault. Look, if I tell you that we're going to talk about salah, salah, automatically, what do we think? It's ibadah. If I talk to you about fasting, automatically we think, oh, fasting, it's a religious thing. Ibadah means it's to do with deen. A marriage, straight away to think it's like salah and fasting, it doesn't come to our mind. Why? I'll tell you the reason why. Because Salah is something we only Muslims do. Fasting, only us Muslims do in the way we do. Marriage, even Christians marry, even atheists marry, even non-Muslims marry. So we look at marriage like buying a house, selling a house, business, outside of religion. The point is we need to start realizing and understanding that in Islam, even nikah is an act of worship. It's ibadah. It's not a normal, regular, mundane thing. It's an act of ibadah. But we can't think of it because it's like everyone does, even practicing or non-practicing marriage. Marriage is like a worldly thing. What has it got to do with religion? No. It's an ibadah. That's why there's so much reward. The way we carry out other acts of ibadah with sincerity, with ikhlas, with the aim and objective of getting close to Allah with a desire to become close to Allah and without committing sins in the ibadah. Does anybody drink alcohol whilst praying salah? Does anybody dance whilst praying salah? Like in a nude way? Does anybody commit haram whilst they're you know, praying, praying salah? No. Likewise, in the nikah ceremony, if there are sins, it's like you're committing sins whilst praying salah. You have a nikah ceremony, you're performing a sunnah, it's a marriage which is an act of ibadah, it's like Allahu Akbar, give us whiskey. 
It's a bit like that. That's why it's really important, taqwa, at the time of marriage, avoid sinful practices. Sinful practices conduct the marriage in accordance with the sunnah. What are sinful practices? Like what? For example, give us some examples. I'm doing all the talking. You guys talk now. Music. Oh. Haram music being played, one example. Anything else? Uh, mixing of the genders. Yeah, but it, what in what way? The open, free, casual mixing of the genders. We should put a bit of those things as well to make it clear. The open, free, casual mixing of the genders where people are dressed inappropriately and there's like, you know, two people are getting married and another 25 people are doing their jobs. Some people go to weddings just to check out girls and guys. That's what happens. So, will there be any blessing in that marriage? Of course not. You know, there's people dancing, men and women dancing, which are they're not related, they're touching each other, hugging each other. The food sometimes is haram. The way you need to make sure the food is halal. Also make sure, along with it being halal, it's healthy food. Okay. A lot of salad. Um, also, so these are things in um, the nikah ceremony. And try to keep it simple. And also, don't make like too much expectations and uh, within within the marriage ceremony, but we'll leave it to that. So the, the simpler the marriage ceremony, the better inshallah it will be. And number C, taqwa after marriage. I need to move fast now. Taqwa after marriage, until both spouses do not fear of, have the fear of Allah in their hearts and accountability of the hereafter, it is difficult to fulfill each other's rights and have a prosperous marriage. Now after marriage, from day one, like I said, it has to be based on taqwa. Until the husband and wife do not look, you know, in the world, there's only two things that prevent people from being generally two things. In the world, there's only two things that prevent crime, murder, evil things in the world. Number one, the law. If there was no law enforcement, there was no police, there would be crimes like people. Everywhere there'll be crime. And the second way is people have this accountability of the Akhirah. That's why religion helps prevent evil even in this world. Because people are concerned about their next life. You will not steal because Allah is watching over me. So in a marriage, until the husband and wife both don't realize that everything we say or do to each other the way we speak to one another, it will be difficult to fulfill each other's rights. There was one sheikh, I think I quoted this and mentioned this before, again, he's a teacher of one of my sheikhs. His name was Dr. Abdul Hay Arifi, rahimahullah. He passed away in, in the 19, early 1980s. He was from Pakistan. He's a sheikh and teacher of Mufti Muhammad Taqi Uthmani who is my teacher. So he quotes from him that his sheikh and teacher, Dr. Abdul Hayarif Rahimullah, once said that I've been married for 55 years. In 55 years of marriage, I've never raised my voice over my wife. Never shouted at her, never raised, never spoke to her in a raised tone. Like, just imagine, 55 years, he was probably in the 70s at that time, 55 years, never. He was telling his students. Did Dr. Uthmani says after that, that this is the greatest miracle. The greatest miracle of a sheikh is not, you know, mashallah, he's reading long nawafil and he's got a big thobe and big scarf and looks the part. That's not what makes you a big sheikh. This, this is what makes you a big sheikh. 55 years of marriage. Why? Why did he do that? He has this connection with Allah. Connection with Allah. Taqwa. You know, you see some of these great people, it's just amazing, amazing. My own teacher, Shaykh Mufti Taqwa Uthmani, I've seen him. I mean, I, I've, one of my teachers, some of you may have heard of his name, some of you may not have heard of his name, but I've spent, alhamdulillah, quite a bit of time with him, especially in the last two, three, four years, to different countries, and he normally travels with his wife. And his wife comes to the UK as well, and now she gives lots of lectures to the sisters, and you know, she's become really popular, because really well she explains 
a real pious woman. I know her as well, I've spoken to her quite a few times. But honestly, I've seen this is a great sheikh, but the way he, you know, he treats his wife and the way his wife treats him, both sides. His wife, we'll talk about some of the issues inshallah later, the way she has this love and admiration and respect for him. Like for him, for her, there is no one greater on planet Earth than her husband. I've seen them eating. We are at a hotel, downstairs in the lo lobby, lunchtime, dinner time. Came down. His wife came and sat down on the table. He went, got all the food. She wanted tea. He went. Everything. She's he's putting it in her plate. He's getting things and putting it in her plate and feeding her. Sometimes when you become really popular, a sheikh or something, you think like, you know, you go everywhere else, everyone's feeding you. So you think that you're a sheikh at home as well. It can play with your mind because you're going everywhere else and everyone's sheikh, you know, they're giving you like, you come to Toronto and everyone's, you know, when I go home as well, I'm thinking, okay, why is she not doing that? She's not going to do that. Of course not. You have to feed her. So this taqwa is really, really important. Um, quickly moving on, because we're going to take a break in about five, ten minutes. So that's number one. Number two, we said two important ingredients for a successful and happy and blissful marriage. Number two is tazkiyah. Tazkiyah is also very, very important. I'm just going to do this quickly. Tazkiyah, you've heard of the word tazkiyah. Tazkiyah is basically what, the translation's here, reforming the inner self. Working on replacing blameworthy character traits with praiseworthy ones. This is what tazkiyah means. Look, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created all of us with these traits, blameworthy character traits, to a certain degree. Why did he create us with them? Allah knows best. Hikmah. These are animalistic traits. Greed, pride, arrogance, ego, jealousy, hatred. These are great. We are all created. But the level of how much they are within us varies and changes from person to person. Did you understand what I just said? Imam al-Ghazali, Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, he says in his Ihya al some people are born with good character. And some people are born with bad character. The ones who are born with bad character cannot have an excuse that, oh, I was born an angry mad person. I was born angry. You know, we find some people are so calm, cool. We say in the UK, cool as a cucumber. I don't know if you have that phrase here. They are so calm. Like some people are just naturally so cool. And some people are just fiery, naturally. The one who's fiery can't say, oh Allah, like that's you, Craig, that's in my nature. No, that's your test. That's the way you're going to enter Jannah. So is it unfair? No, it's fair. Why? Because the other person will have a test in a different department of life. One person might be angry, but doesn't have too much love of the dunya, so he won't try to earn haram money. That person is cool, you know, but he's like, he's got so much love of the dunya, he's always trying to do fraud and cheating and going around and trying to, you know, earn haram money. Everyone has some trait where the challenge applies, and eventually it all balances itself out. So, we are all created with these blameworthy character traits to a certain degree and these are called animalistic traits why are they call animalistic traits because a lot of the animals have these things that's why a poet said alayka bil ruh fastakmil fadaila fa innaka bil bil ruhi la bil jasad insan perfect your inner soul because you're a human with that not with your body because you share the body with the animals as well You are, we share our bodies with, with animals, okay? So we are all, why are they call animalists? This is why Islam tells us first become human beings. These are all animalistic traits. Like for example, greed. Being greedy is an animalistic trait. Have you ever gone to a pond where there's like swans and birds and give, throw bread to them? Have you seen them fighting for bread? Have you seen the big, you know, fat white pond, you know, swan chasing all the small birds away and not trying to even though eating like 10 pieces still won't give the other one small one and let them have it it's like, it's, you know the, this is what human beings do, but we don't do it with bread what do we do? we do it in business with properties 
in hundreds and thousands of dollars. That's what we're doing. This it's the same trait. So these jealousy and greed and hatred and being envious and this, these are animalistic traits. Islam has come, Allah sent the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to make humans humans. It's actually in the Quran, one of the reasons he was sent was for Tazkiyah. Allah is the one who sent his Messenger. One of the things he would do is recite the verses of the Quran. الكتابة, and he teaches the Quran. Hikmata teaches wisdom. And he teaches them tazkiyah and purifies their souls. And teaches people how to be human beings and not be animals. So these animalistic traits, we are all created, every single one of us, to a certain degree. Our job in this life is what? To work constantly until, no one will become perfect, but until we die, every day we need to work on ourselves and try to remove or at least decrease. Sometimes it's not going to be possible to come to like anger, it's not possible to eliminate. And the Quran, Islam doesn't tell us to eliminate it as well. It's not something you have to completely remove anger. That's, you won't be a, it's just not possible to remove it completely. That's why the Quran says, Like anger is not something you can kill, but you can what? Trample and suppress. We have all these things will remain. Love of dunya will remain. You can't completely remove it because if you remove it, you're never going to go for a job. That's what Allah created. If, if you have no love of dunya, you'll never earn money, like nothing. You just, I don't, want to, I don't want to earn at all. But suppress it. So all these things we need to, when we say replace, in other words, suppress them and replace and put on top of that, on top of all these diseases, like pride. So replace that or put on top of pride. Humility. So Tazkiyah is really, really important. And I've mentioned here, these spiritual diseases have a direct impact on one's marriage. Such as the following, look, A, greed and obsession with wealth. I actually once did a whole lecture just on this, how every single spiritual disease has a direct impact on marriage. Greed and obsess obsession with wealth. If a husband has greed and obsession with wealth, he will be very miserly and very stingy. He will, he will not fulfill the financial rights of his wife. And even if he does, he's, you know, he's counting every dollar. Yesterday I gave him 34 cents. So today I'm going to another you know, 6 cents, so that's 40. So you've got 40, so you know, he's going to count every single penny or cent. You guys, you guys have cents, yeah? Used. Hmm? Used to. You know how some people don't know it's cents? Pennies. Yeah, but you have cents, but you still... It's not that you only buy them with dollars, like minimum is one dollar. You still buy things, like how much is a sweet for? Like, a, do you have like a five cent sweet you can buy? Five sure. Sorry? You do, yeah? Five cents and then you have it. Okay. Um, so, husband will not fulfill his financial rights. If a wife has this obsession with wealth, uh, sorry, and yeah, wealth and greed, she will never ever be satisfied. You buy her five pairs of shoes, she'll want the six. You buy her 25 handbags, she'll still say, I haven't got Gucci. And if you buy her that as well, then she'll say, I still have, don't have that. But I don't have that house. Even if you get a nice house, just have a look at their house, they've got four bedrooms. You buy four bedrooms, you put five bedrooms. There's always something that she hasn't got. It's a problem. It's a massive problem. You know, man, money matters massive problem in marriage. So many marriages break down because of financial reasons. And one of the main thing is because it's love of dunya, greed. People need to be content. You know the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in one hadith that when you look for a spouse, and this was in relation to the wife, but you can apply to the man as well, that arda bil yaseer Someone who's content with less alaykum bil abqar fa innahunna a'dabu afwaad Last quality was Find a wife who is going to be content with less. As long as you've got happiness, you've got a home. You know, we want a house, but we don't have a home. 
You could be in a rented house where you could be happy. You could have a small house where you could be happy. You could have a massive mansion and you'll be in one corner of that mansion and she'll be on the other corner. You won't see each other. You just WhatsApp each other. Okay, I'm on the fifth floor. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm in the bottom fifth floor kitchen. Okay. Where's the son? Well, he's on the third floor playing his computer games. Where's, where's the daughter? Well, she's on the, on the other floor somewhere, in the swimming pool somewhere. Okay. It's like you're living in some kind of hostel or some mansion or castle or something. Small house. <clears throat> Small house, being happy, is far better than having a big mansion. So this has a direct uh, link with marriage problems. Number two, anger. We all, we all know about anger, and I've just talked about it. A marriage, anger is a marriage wrecker. It's an absolute record. Seriously, so many cases I've come across where mar uh, marriages have ended because of anger. Control the tongue and learn to exercise salah. Anger, we need, to, we need to work on this. There are methods mentioned in the Quran and Sunnah how to work on marriage, but also we can also get anger management treatment. As long as it's not anti-Islam, there's nothing which is anti-Islam. It doesn't mean that it's haram to go to some non-Muslim or someone who's going to teach you ways of trying to treat your anger. It's like, it's like an illness. You go to the hospital for cancer treatment or whatever treatment. So this is a type of treatment. It's not a problem. So we have Islamic treatments as well as we, we can get some other treatments. But if someone has this, it's part of Tazkiyah. Jealousy. Spouses will compare marriages and become jealous of everything. Whether it's a man who's jealous. Hasad, hasad. You know, it's a major disease. That's why we recite to him. In Sharri, hasad is a hasad. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Iyyahum wal hasad. Beware of jealousy. Fa'inna al hasad ya'kulu al hasanat kama ta'kulu al-nar al Jealousy eats away your good deeds as fire eats away wood. The first person to be jealous was Iblis. And that's why what, what happened to him because of jealousy. So jealousy, it's a, it's, it's a big problem, jealousy. And so many marriages end up because of jealousy as well. Um, so anyway, uh, spouses will compare marriages. So every time, you know, you look at someone else's marriage, but look at their house, and look at their... Oh, he takes her to all the holidays every, every year. He's going to Dubai Sharif, as though it's Makkah Mukarramah. And, you know... Uh, Look at them, and they've gone there, and you don't take me. It's like, forget it, everyone's life is different, and everyone's marriage is different. Just live and deal with your life, and stop being jealous of, with anyone else. One sister-in-law will be jealous from another sister-in-law. My mother-in-law treats her better, and then you complain to, to, her, to her husband, uh, you know, your brother's wife, like, you know, she smiles at her, her more, she doesn't smile at me, it's like, you know, and she cries about it. It's like, it's okay, it doesn't matter, who cares if she smiles at you or not? Forget seeking attention. We've become a big attention-seeking human being species now. And this has made us more attention-seeking as well. Also, I want to write a whole article on the, you know, the harmful, just finishing, inshallah, harmful effects and different ways this smartphone is harmful to us. So jealousy, and even brothers can be jealous. Now, oh, like, look, look at his wife, she does this to him and does that to him, and look, and look at you, and... Anyway, this jealousy and also part of this jealousy is looking at other people's. Never compare your life to anyone else's life. Everyone is different. That's why we look different, we think differently, we sound differently. Our fingerprints are different. We're all different. Everyone is different. Number E, uh, sorry, E, A, B, C, D, sorry, D. Pride and arrogance. If we have this disease, this disease, spouses will never admit their mistakes or apologize. This is also pride and arrogance. Kibr. We have to replace that with tawadu. And if you have pride, if you have an ego, impossible. You know you're in the wrong. I have so many cases where, like, no, my husband, he's, he doesn't want to go to any imam or sheikh. He's not, no. That's it. He's got an ego. Like, I, I'm not in the wrong. Impossible. The whole world will tell me that I'm wrong, but I'm not wrong. I know, they, they don't know. Or a wife could be like that as well. So ego, pride, arrogance will create problems in the marriage. Never, you will never apologize. Selfishness. A happy marriage is based on both spouses being selfless. Now this is, selfishness is a spiritual disease. Selfishness is a spiritual disease. Uh, the opposite of that is actually called ethar. 
giving preference to others. And I've mentioned this on many occasions, maybe in that marriage course here as well. A marriage can only be prosperous if it's based on ithar, which means that you give preference to your spouse over yourself. Marriage is based on all is based on fulfilling the rights of the other. Every person enters a marriage in order to fulfill the rights of the other. You know when we enter marriages, normally people enter in the marriage with what thought in their mind? Me, myself, I. I normally say marriage should be you, yourself, you. It's all about giving, it's not about receiving. That's not what marriage is for. But you will receive. The more you give, the more you will receive. But it's don't worry about receiving. Make it all about the other person. All about the other person. So being selfless. Liking for others what you like for yourself. Be absolutely selfless. And then lastly, absence of sincerity, ikhlas, and correct intentions. Both spouses must be sincere and make their marriage all about, like and this is similar connected to the ifa, make their marriage about the other person. So, ikhlas is having a good intention. So when we get married, just like we have to have ikhlas when we offer salah. When I pray salah, I should pray for Allah, not showing off. Ostentation, riyah, the hadith says, man salla yura'i faqad ashraka billah, whoever prays to show off is committed shirk with Allah. Likewise, marriage as well should be with sincerity. Sincerity means that it should be to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to act upon the sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and make the marriage all about the other person. All about the other person. It's all about the whole... Seriously, this is the golden principle that I always mention. I think I mentioned it here as well, that after delivering this marriage course on 200 million occasions, uh, like a lot of times, that if someone asked me, I think I mentioned this, I don't know if I did, if I didn't then I'll stand with this right now. If someone asked me, give me one summary, one point, like this 10 days of marriage course or whatever. One point, that's a summary of everything. All this tazkiyah and taqwa and marriage problems and everything, summary of one thing. I personally feel this is my understanding. A summary, the khulasa, is that if every person goes into the marriage, with the intention that it's all about pleasing the other person and nothing for me. And if you can't do that, then don't get married. But if you do, it's all about the other person. Everything is about the other person. Every marriage will be sorted out. And I've also mentioned that this, every part of marriage is, if we make it about fulfilling the rights and pleasing your spouse. The wife says, I am in this marriage not for myself. I am in this marriage for my husband. I am here to look after, give love to, give attention to, cater for the needs of, give company to, fulfill the rights of my husband. That's, forget about me. I'll get all my rewards in Akhirah. But don't worry, if you do that, you will get it in this world as well. It's impossible for you not to get something in return unless you've married some crazy lion or something. You know, as long as you've married a human, it's impossible that you won't get something in return. Unless an absolute mad person. And likewise, a husband, go in the marriage, I'm not in this here because she's going to do this and cook me biryani and cook me pizzas and this, 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 this. I am in here to look after a servant of Allah and fulfill her needs and give her love and give her attention, give her companionship, give her, you know, give her company, look after her, and together we look after our children. To the point, and I think I mentioned this before, to the point that the most intimate part of marriage, this is what I've realized, even the most, this is quite frank and open with I am being, even the most intimate, intimate aspect of marriage, sexual relations must be about the other person. It's not for our own pleasure. A lot of people don't think like that. And I've not said this from my pocket, I've actually derived it from a hadith. In the hadith of Al-Bukhari, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, the man sallallahu alayhi wa sallam states, وَفِي بُضْعِ أَحَدِكُمْ صَدَقَةٌ Sexual relations is charity. I've never read this in a book, this explanation. This hadith is there. This is what I've derived. I could be wrong. Allah forgive me if I am. But this is... you. Could, one of you fulfilling your sexual relations with your spouse, it's charity. What is charity about? Giving. Charity is about the other person. When you give charity, zakat, do you want money or are you looking after someone? 
So the Messenger وسلم, called sexual relations sadaqa, which means that when a husband and wife are engaged in intimacy, both of them, and this is important because so many problems occur because of the bedroom department. Seriously, so many, so many husbands complain, well, my wife doesn't do this, and she doesn't do this, and I want a second wife, and I want a third wife, and, and then sometimes wives complain as well. But if you make it all about, not self-gratification, about fulfilling the needs, that when, you, when, when a husband and wife, when they are both engaged in sexual relations, they are only concerned about the pleasure of their spouse. Seriously, it's a really important point. This is what they are concerned about. Then, if that's the case with even the most intimate part of marriage, then every aspect of marriage. Inshallah. We're going to end here. We're going to take a break. Sorry, I've gone over time for break. It's 11, but we'll just take like maximum 10 minute break. Yeah, 11, 10, please come back so we can start with some of the reasons that break marriages, inshallah. I'll try to do all of them if I can. If I can't, then we'll do some of them. Because those 12, 10 reasons are very important. Maybe I might only be able to do six. So we'll do the rest of the other six tomorrow, inshallah.